Welcome to the Human Conversation Podcast with Jules White, the real dragon slayer, author and entrepreneur sales coach. Tune in weekly for Human Conversation about business and sales. Enjoy business expert interviews, educational episodes and virtual cuppers with entrepreneur business owners. So grab yourself a cuppa and enjoy. Here is your host, Jules White. So welcome everybody to the Human Conversation. I've got a fabulous chat with me today. This is Andy Nielsen and he is the business owner of Twisted Orange. Fabulous name. We are going to talk about where that even comes from. But first of all, welcome to the Human Conversation, Andy. Thank you, Jules. Much appreciated. Nice to be here. It's lovely. Whereabouts in the country are you right now? I, I live in East Devon. Oh, so, uh, so, you're so lucky. Nice, nice, quiet place called Sidmouth. I don't know. I don't think I've ever told you, but I was born in Bournemouth. Um, but I, we moved away when I was tiny. And, and it leaves me feeling like I have to go and live by the sea one day. I just have that yearning, you know. So I, you're so lucky. That, that, that's what we did. We lived in the middle of the country in Shropshire. And one day we decided, actually we were in pool at the time. And we said, let's put the house in the market and see what happens. Um, I think we sold it in a few days. So that was the start of um, yeah, a journey, I guess, in terms of you know, coming down here and, and it's now home. Yeah. I'd quite like to find out, you know, what did you want to do when you left school? Because I love to know where people start in life. You know, did you kind of have a, a plan, Andy? I, I did, yeah. I wanted to be a, a fast jet pilot. Um, my my father was XRAF, um, etc. And I had all these visions of, of being a pilot. And I actually started up in waste recycling. <laughs> <laughs> I um, love that. Because that was my father's business. He was he was a, a, a world leading authority on waste management at that time, late seventies, early eighties. So I, I left school on the Friday and went to work for my apprenticeship on the Monday. Um so yes, yeah, so I went from fast jet pilot to bin man, really. <laughs> it's a great story. I feel like there's a book there somewhere, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a very short one, but yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. So what did you do for your dad? Was it just sort of whatever needed doing? It was an apprenticeship uh, in terms of engineering. Um, so I did a lot of um, drafting. So you know, in the old days when, when draftsmen used to put designs on paper um, before CAD, I, I did my apprenticeship in basic engineering, so I made toolboxes, et cetera, as, as you do. Um, and then assisted in the factory um, with the plan to, to eventually you know, move up into, into the, I guess, the management and the development of the business. But um, sadly, it only lasted four years um, before a couple of customers, I say reneged on a deal, it sounds, sounds awful, but in essence they did and we couldn't afford to uh, manage the, the lack of cash flow. So sadly, mm. the business went, uh, went bankrupt. So what was next? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think I kind of wandered around for a bit and eventually um, ended up at Royal Worcester okay. uh, when, when manufacturing was done in this country in ceramics. And I was there for 11 years. And so what did you do there? Was that designing or was that, in, you know? No, that was, um, it was what they call production control at the time. So um, scheduling of, of ceramic ware into the decorating areas. Um, so I went from being the son of the boss in a small engineering firm to working in a factory of, my particular factory, I have three, four hundred people. Um, the majority of the work, work and it's not sexist, were done by ladies in terms of the lithographic transferring um and they were they were a tough audience um, <laughs> and they they ripped ripped into me something rotten on my first few days the first few years actually but um yes it, it taught me taught me a lot of lessons i would suggest um probably not all all good but that was then i was then thrown into buying and that was my first real experience of a buying role 
Yeah. Um, because in those days, stock control was done by cards rather than computers. Yes, it was. So yeah. Because of my organisational skills, um, they wanted me to go into into that area and, and apply that, if you like. Um, and and that was it, really. Ever since, I've, I've done nothing apart from buying in supply chains. That was nineteen ninety seven, I guess, when like my wow. first buying role. So that's that's a long career, isn't it? A lot of knowledge there, I suspect. Royal Royal Worcester, you said, didn't you? Yeah. So there was yeah. a few, wasn't there? Royal Dalton, Royal Worcester. Yeah. My mum collected yeah. a lot of china. Yeah. And I had thin walls and things. Wedgwood. Stowed. Yeah. 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 So so Stoke was, you know, obviously the Potters. Yeah. Um, Denby as well. Um, yes, I remember Denby. In Central UK. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, good memories. I suppose I've got a parallel journey in a sense, in that I sold stainless steel. So then I was sitting in this world full of men. Um, mm. I mean, quite literally, I, I rarely saw a female. I think we had another couple of female salespeople on the sales on the stainless steel team. Um, but my customers were all men in machine shops, machining steel, you know. Mm. Tough gig, really tough. Yes. So yeah. we had a, a quite, it's interesting, isn't it? We've had a similar sort of journey, but obviously just on, on different uh, levels with the, you, you with all the women and me with all the men. <laughs> <laughs> but you yeah. do learn a lot, don't you? Yes, but they, they were, they, in fairness, they were good times. They were amazingly genuine people. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there was a fair bit of banter, but actually they were very hardworking and all looked after each other, so... So I knew you probably first time. For some reason, I feel like, did you actually come on the Wide Boston Golf Day or did I invite you and you couldn't come? You invited me and I sadly couldn't make it. That's how we first connected, wasn't it? That's correct, yeah. yeah. A few years so ago now. Where were you working at the time? Because that would have been, I don't know, I'm thinking it was 2012, 2013 time, maybe. I would have been um, around just come out of fitness first or going into um, Clark's shoes, I guess. Yeah, I seem to remember Clark's. I mean, the thing is, Andy, you've worked for some big brands, haven't you? I have. I've been very lucky, yes. I mean, um, Halfords, from, from a retail perspective. I moved back into ceramics for a short time um, into Wedgwood uh, for a couple of years. Uh, yeah, fitness first, Clark's. So, yeah, I mean... Um, and, and they've all kind of shaped the journey, I guess. Um, not all positively, but you know, that's what it does, isn't it? That you know, those those uh, roles and um, those positions and those businesses and the people in them shape the person you become, and, and that's yeah. certainly what's happened to me. Yeah, very much. And you mentioned obviously you were in a buying role. That was kind of your forte. Yeah, so I, I, I've yeah since eighty seven. That that's what I've done. I learned very I caught the bug very quickly if you like in at Royal Worcester um and whilst it took me a time to to fully realize that you know this is the career I wanted um once once I realized it and I became a lot more inquisitive about it and that was the reason I left Royal Worcester one of the main reasons was um to to be inquisitive you know I was, I was lucky at Royal Worcester I had a, an incredible boss called Duncan Lewis who was was a very good friend as well um and throughout my not tantrums as such but i was i was a young young pup who thought he knew a lot more than he did um and duncan was very patient and very supportive of me uh and i'll you know, for, forever be grateful to that um and he kind of set me on my way really he provided that first bit of foundation of here's what you need to do if you want to become a good buyer and um to this day he, he was my my first role model in procurement. And I think um, this is why I wanted this conversation in a way with you, because you're kind of my opposite, you're my oppo. You know, if you think <laughs> about this, um, I don't see it like that at all, as you know. But, you know, that was what we were taught in the mm. old days. They would put salespeople on buyer's courses so that they understood how buyers buy. I don't know if they did that with you buyers, whether you ever sat on sales courses, but it was always well, that competition, you know. Ooh, yeah. It's a buyer. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It was it was very old school when I first went into buying and um you know, the account manager used to come down, take you out for lunch, have a few beers, walk back after an hour and a bit. Um then you sit down and say, Yeah, okay, 
that's fine. Deal done. The role or the relationship between the account manager and the, the buyer was very different then. And now it's become a lot more technical, if you like, and a lot more focused on value and delivery. Whereas there it was, it was, <laughs> the relationship was focused on being transactional yes. rather than being proactive or, or, yes. or you know, mutually beneficial. It was all about the numbers yeah. and the incentivization on their part. And of course, at that time, you know, buyers weren't incentivized. So salespeople used to come in in their you know, flash towards Sierras or whatever they were with, yeah. their, push bu- with their push button radios. Um, <laughs> and their bricks, uh, and, <laughs> their brick and, yeah, phones. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And, and, and you look at it and you go, well, hold on a second, that's not quite right, is it? Because if I'm saving money for the company, shouldn't I be incentivized? And, and obviously now it's, it's a lot different, but then it was crikey. It seems like a different world. Yeah. But I, I did learn at an early stage that it was about mutual respect. It was about the way you communicated, not what you communicated. And you know, I, I wasn't great. I wasn't. I was far from perfect. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, the old school stuff, because sales was the same. Sales was about transaction and numbers. Mm. And actually, in some businesses, that's still how they look at it, sadly. But I think more and more. We're now realising that we need to be actually working on that human level. You know, you know, I'm all about human connection when I talk about absolutely. sales. So yeah, absolutely. Let's just talk about Clark's because um, you were pretty senior, weren't you, at Clark's, Andy? Yeah, I, I look after the, the procurement uh, for global supply chain, so the logistics, the warehousing, etc. Not working directly for the global logistics director, but you know, dotted line, if you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my role was about supporting that particular function you know, globally, so Asia Pacific, Americas, and obviously Europe and the UK. Um, and and again, you know, I, I was really lucky to work with some incredibly talented people and passionate people. Um, and it's heartbreaking to see, you know, the, the fact that clerks are, are are struggling now. Um, but at the time, you know, we we. Between us, you know, the, the, the people that were involved in Clarks at the time, and I'm still in contact with a number of them, it was very much about what can we do together. Um, and, and we had some great successes. And again, it was very much about bringing relations to the fore. Relationship development wasn't just about external with suppliers and salespeople. It was about internal with stakeholders. Yeah. And that, that's the key thing for me is a procurement function is, is at times quite standalone-ish and seen as just a cost-cutting mob and it's quite difficult to get a different message across in terms of no i don't want to just cut costs i want to come in and add value and add resource and take on the difficult problems and i I was really lucky that you know i had a i had a group of people in, in clerks as my stakeholders who were very welcoming of that and also really supportive yeah um, and yeah we yeah we had some fun. Um, there were some challenges, but I I look back at you know a huge amount of pride. Now, did you do a lot of travelling in that job? I, I did. Yeah, it was a lot of a lot of travel to the states, um, which uh, I think has been well documented that the travel was partially you know the, the cause of, of my um, my poor mental health ultimately. But yeah, you know it was it was it was what was needed. You know, face to face contact is 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 always much better than phone, Zoom, emails. And during that time at Clark's, there was a lot of work going on with, and I'm sure you won't want me saying, um, UPS. So they're one of our, our key suppliers. We had to create efficiencies. And the face-to-face element, the time invested in that relationship from our side, I think paid dividends from that side. And, I, and Carl said to me that we created a lot of efficiency shall I say, we didn't reduce costs, we created efficiency on both sides. Yeah. And Kyle was saying actually, he felt the relationship was better, having gone through that process, if you like, um, than before, was, was a really good indication of what good relationship management, I felt was. And I think it was worth the investment in, in the travel. Yeah. It's lots of businesses and, and you know, clerks at the time were, were challenging around costs, etc. and rightly so, but you have to get the balance right between communicating by email, having a relationship by email, or a proper relationship. And 
it's, it's a very subjective matter, isn't it? How much you should travel, how much you, well, given the crisis, now, how much you, you will eventually travel. Actually, I, I think the results more than justified the investment from myself and, and the colleagues around me, to be honest. How about the impact it did have on your mental health? So, you know, because obviously that did have an effect on you, didn't it? It did. It, I, to be honest with you, I just didn't, well, did I, I didn't realise it, is what I was going to say. I, I, I didn't allow myself to realise it. So I was very dismissive of it. And as I, if you like, got lower and lower in terms of whether it be self-esteem and confidence, etc., um, you know, it impacted on, on, on various matters, you know, as well as my health, but obviously, you know, family as well. Um, yeah. uh, but you're in denial. I, I, was in, I was in complete denial. I think, and I, I wrote an article um, saying that, you know, my breakdown came only as a surprise to me. <laughs> because, you know, I, I, would, I was a typical bloke. I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm fine. I can work 24 hours a day. Not a problem. I can fly to fly to Washington and fly back, no sleep, that's fine. And I wasn't, it was just a complete yeah. lie and a fabrication. And um, it took a few years to catch up with me, but when it did, it, it, it really did, sadly. So, and, um, and what's been the, um, the longer term effect of that, Andy, as far as you're concerned? Well, I, I think eventually when I, when I did uh, fall over, I guess is, is the phrase I would use, it, it makes you take stock. You know, there was, um, it was a very dark time and you know i think the impact of me and my issues really came home to me and in fairness i, I was i was very lucky i thought you know the nhs were brilliant i was seen more or less the same day credit where credit's due i know people have got their views on nhs and hopefully it's a bit better since, since the crisis but for me personally what they did was was incredible um but also by the same token what my family did was was incredible too so yeah um because they had to put up with you know, this person who's in denial it was actually a right miserable git um short-tempered tired concerned distracted so yeah i mean long term it's i think i've 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 got to get to used to a different me so yeah. you know i've come out of corporate world been been working with Louise, my wife, for, for two and a half years as a consultant, interim. You know, it allows me, if you like, to to better manage the impact on my health. And uh, I work with a counsellor, and um, it's about coping mechanisms for me. Yes. Personally, and again, this is very personal. This is this. It doesn't apply to anybody else because everybody is different. Um, but for me personally. Uh, the impact was I, I need to be able to switch off or switch out, if you like, and have flexibility um, and try and make up for, regain, whatever whatever phrase you want to use for the you know, number of years that actually I, I'd been ill. And I, yeah. I suggest that's probably, I don't know, 15, 20 years. Gosh, that's, um, that's such a long time, isn't it, Andy? I, w- I want to go on to talk more about this work you're doing with your wife because that's so exciting but just so that we don't just move away from the the mental health subject too quickly I suppose my final thoughts on that with you is what would you now say to somebody who you know might be who you were these years ago you know and if they are listening and they're thinking actually I really am in a spiral or I I feel like I'm in a hole I can't get out you know what's the message around that Andy do you think I think it's very easy for me to say in hindsight what people um, could contemplate doing, not should. Um, I think you need to, if if you have a a family around you, then let them in. Um, Talk to them, explain, even if you're not sure what's going on. I think it's really difficult in a corporate world in terms of if you say, do you know what? I can't. I can't do this because I'm, I'm struggling with my health. The business almost has a, a duty of care, not to put any further pressure on you, and actually take pressure off. Mm. So, and this, this is this isn't necessary advice. It's just just my personal it's view. It's the reality it, of what happens. Yeah. As soon as you put your hand up and say, "Look, I need help," then my thought was always, "Well, that's the end of my career." Yeah. 
Um, and people are in a really difficult situation. There are lots of amazing organizations and people out there willing to help. What advice would I give? I think give yourself a break. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that you're weak or at fault or wrong, um, which is all the things I thought. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, I felt ashamed of myself and my failure because yeah. that's how I saw it as a failure. Yeah. Um, but now um, it's different because whilst I still have my issues, I, I, I feel I'm able to cope better. I mean, probably ask my wife better than me, but and, and <laughs> they sound odd. I don't know if my cat is watching this, but she introduced me to what, um, a mood cards. You know, it's a sad face or a happy face or a concerned face or anxious face. And on the back, it's some of the, some of the things you can um, that resonates, you know, with where you're feeling. Actually, some of the things you can do to get around it. So, um, so mood, mood cards for me work as part of my personal coping mechanism. And when I have anxiety, then it's a, it's a question of how do you bring yourself back into a calm reality, yeah. and it's about focusing on. Um, five things you can see four things you can hear three things you can smell two things you can touch or yeah i mix it up because i never get the order right but again <laughs> it's just having those coping mechanisms that that, that suit you yeah um, I love that. that's real mindfulness there isn't it all of that stuff you just said about just being aware of all that lovely stuff like smelling yeah, and touching I, yeah and, and does it always work no absolutely not no. I, had, I, had a, I had a bit of a mini meltdown a few weeks ago um, because I, I wasn't following, if you like, my own coping mechanisms. Because I was too head down, must do this, must finish this, what's going to happen, what happens if I run out of work, what, blah, blah, blah. And it all becomes too much. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure that you know, that resonates with a lot of people, because it's been a tough time for a lot of people. It has, um, it has been tough. And I, I love some of the things you've said. I actually think they are truly helpful some of the things you've just mentioned some of those small things um you know that aren't always obvious things but just you know anyone who is listening if, if they're feeling that way i think some of the things you've mentioned andy are brilliant maybe we can get a link to mood cards or something i'd, I'd love to put that in the narrative i mean i want to just mention arthur ellis because i'm a non-exec director i have talked to you about them i'll, I'll keep yeah. talking to you about arthur ellis i know i will we, we will discuss things around them one of the, uh, the guy who started Arthur Ellis was, uh, is bipolar and just took years to be diagnosed, which was part of the problem for him. And what I love about his philosophy and, and the ethos around Arthur Ellis is he recognises that the corporate workplace, it actually fuels the problems that we have with mental health, just the sheer nature of the workplace it triggers all those little elements that build up. And what he wants to do is almost come in and do a proactive approach with businesses so that they create an environment that stops those triggers. Instead of suddenly reacting every time someone then has a mental health issue, make it a proactive approach whereby you create a better environment so that mental mm. health doesn't keep perhaps rearing its head as much as it could and I love that philosophy it's quite hard mm. to get your head around well what does that look like and how can we do that but I think as Arthur Ellis uh, what they're trying to do is become partners with businesses so that actually it's a constant relationship as opposed to we'll come and do a workshop so you can tick a box and say that you told everybody they're going to be okay now you know yeah. so it's yeah. a really interesting approach I, I wonder what you feel about that approach you know from your perspective being through it I think there's lots of incredible people and genuine people out there who who want to help organisations. I, I, let's be honest, some organisations see that as an expensive option and, and, dare I say, it maybe look to tick boxes as opposed to do anything radical. But that said, you know, it, it, it is about looking after your most precious commodity, which yes. is your workforce. Exactly. And, you know, I, I always liken it to the fact I was walking around an office um, one day and every laptop had to be chained to a desk, so, so a security strap to a desk, which, which I absolutely agree with. Um, 
but it did seem that that organization was taking more care of its hardware than its, than its people <laughs> yeah. because um there was no real uh i guess proactive say positive approach to, to health yeah. it was um well if you were ill how can we mitigate against us being liable yeah. if you like i do think that you know society is now more conditioned to areas such as this a lot of people still don't understand it um a lot of people are still concerned it will impact on on their on their careers which yeah. which i think is fair enough which you mentioned yeah yeah but i think yeah you know, if, if anybody's watching this you know you're an sme or, or you're an hr director or you you, you, know, you want to at least understand if you like what's out there it doesn't cost you any money to talk to people it, it, it's it's incredibly important mm -hmm. and i think that anybody that talks to these experts it can only be a positive mm -hmm. it's just about people feeling valued and um, supported and listened to mm -hmm. instead of you know you're just a number so if you don't do, I'll get somebody else to do it. Yeah. And, you know, so I've been very lucky. I, I haven't worked for many organisations like that. There's so much lovely, rich content in that conversation that we've just had there. I love that we talked about mm. that. So important. Um, and I totally value that you've been so open about it because I know it's going to help people. That's the point. The more you can talk about it, the more people you'll help out there, which is amazing. I hope so. I, I... I've got to be really honest that you know I have I, I do try and be open, and I know that I've caused awkwardness in some people around me. So last year I was, I was captain of the golf club, and mine was my chosen charity, and I know that people felt awkward and people didn't like it, and that was a real shame. That's humans for you, isn't it? And uh, it, it is, yeah, yeah, and and you know I I think it's it's my it's my right to speak about it if I want to and if it helps one person then that's great yeah. um I think if anything if the last two and a half years have shown anything to me it's who my friends are who yeah who my real friends are it's really great and I love that you've you've talked in that way about it thank you for that Andy but look let's come on to twisted orange yes you're going to ask me where the name came from. Well, of right? course I am. Well, you expected <laughs> I would. In all fairness, all, all of the creative elements of the business, all, all the really good stuff has, has come from my wife. And in fairness, our oldest daughter, Danielle, who's, um, who's our, we call Wordsmith. So she's the content provider, does the website, and does all the, does all the, the amazing stuff. Um, Twisted Orange was, because um, Louise works in, in food and drink, and that's what, that's what her, her skill set's in. And we wanted something different. And I think you know, we, we were driving from Worcester back home one day. I think it was on the M5. And we just started bouncing things backward and forward. And um, I think I'm going to try and take credit for it. But I think it was probably Louise who, who <laughs> said, that's it, Twisted Orange. And so the rest of history is only a few years ago. But um, yeah, it's it designed to be different, I guess. I like the idea of having a, a brand that makes me curious. You know, and, and, and that's actually quite smart, isn't it? Sometimes it's great to have something that does what it says on the tin. That works too. Yeah. Live it, love yeah. it, sell it. There you go, Andy. Yeah. That, yeah. That's, yeah. That's it. that does yeah. what it says on the tin. But Twisted Orange then makes you go, oh, what's that then? You know, so that it, curiosity is lovely. It does. It? That's exactly it. And there are so many different businesses out there. Actually, any level of differentiation is always going to be a positive, isn't it? It's like always it. a good thing, isn't it? So I, I want to talk about what you do because... Um, it's really quite lovely. Um, I, I love what you're, you're doing based on the fact you've had so much experience just in that kind of procurement space. Tell us now what Twisted Orange is all about. Okay, well, I, I guess we, you know, we have two halves. So um, the original Twisted Orange with Louise is very much about commercial support, uh, helping uh, SMEs you know, get products to market, etc. Louise is currently working on a, on a number of projects around food innovation and vertical farming. Um, and then for, for my side, um, I'm, I'm a simple procurement board who's looking to help companies, individuals. So I offer consultancy, I do interim work, uh, and I train people. Um, and I've also started mentoring people as well. 
which I do both, you know, both for friends, but also on a commercial basis, you know, I'm kind of available for hire for, for mentoring, mentoring people, but my real buzz is training. And I, I, I love training. I I train people in the art of procurement, uh, you know, guys, operations, teams, et cetera, uh, globally. But also, I train salespeople. <laughs> I've crossed the divide, if you like. Um, you have you and... stepped into the darkness, Andy? Yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I like to think I brought some light. Um, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we sit on our side of the table, procurement, and we're going. Well, it's about relationships, about relationships. And there's this commercial guy you know, or lady sat opposite. Go in. It's about numbers. It's about numbers. And that's all the buyer wants. We're both sat there with a the complete misconception what the other either wants or needs or thinks that we want. So all I'm trying to do is kind of spread the relationship ethos on both sides. Because mm. actually, if a salespeople knows how procurement mind works, uh, and I get there'll be some people going, well, it's all about the negotiation, it's all about cheap price. That's fine, you know, but that's not me. Um, yeah. It's never been about cost, it's all about value. Yeah. And Every supplier has to make a margin to reinvest back in that relationship. If that supplier is not making any money, why why would they trade with you? Yeah. Why would they give you all the innovation up front? Why would they give you priority over you know scarce materials or, or, or products, etc.? For me, it just seems a natural choice. I'd like to think, and the feedback I get is it gives so much different insight. If you like, yeah. not just you know, once you get in front of a buyer, but how do you get in front of a buyer? Again, so I think it's about how do you instigate positive dialogue that the buyer's not going to go, do you know what, I'm not interested. Yeah. How do you how do you create the need in the buyer to talk to you? Yeah. What yeah, you know, what pressures are the buyers under? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so this yeah. is this is one of my big things, and I know you know what I'm gonna to say to you, but you know, I'm always talking about step into the world of the buyer. You know, we exactly. assume so much and, you know, I'm talking from that sales perspective. Half of the problem is we're trained to do this, this way. Mm-hmm. I must just put that out there. That's my little soapbox head on. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I teach around human connection. I teach around the fact that actually people are your greatest asset. And so, you know, you can go into this relationship as very uniquely you and that's you're more likely to make that connection by doing it that way but you've got to find out what value means to your buyer because I know what value means to me but does that mean it's the same to you Andy it's a big assumption isn't it it is it is and I think I'm sure we've all seen extremely good selling extremely bad selling extremely good buying extremely bad buying so but I do think you're right you know salespeople um, are trained in or how used to be trained in this very very transactional black or white way. Get in there, get the best deal, get out. Yeah, like it's a fight. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's not about that. Yeah, you know, anybody could go in and get half a percent off from a buyer's side, or negotiate half a percent up from the selling side because we're going to threaten you with this, etc. Anybody can do that. Yeah. You can't. You can't do it every year. Mm. Once once you've got half a percent off or whatever it is. That's it. Your relationship is destroyed with that supplier because they just think you're about the money. Yeah. And that's, you know, buyers sometimes are their own worst enemy because it's all about cost and it shouldn't be. If you imagine yourself as a buyer and yeah. you've, you've got to save money, so you're sat there and you're buying, I don't know, uh, screen cleaner. Yes. Yeah. So you say, right, I need to get, you know, I need to save money. Where do you start? But if you said to the supplier, Right, can you tell me how to have the same product but cheaper? How, can you tell me if that's, you know, that cap can be reduced in diameter or, or length? Or, and actually, you reverse engineer it with the supplier. The supplier will save you more money together with you than you will on your own. Yes, absolutely. Yeah? That's where the relationship comes from. Yeah. And, and that's where the benefit is because yeah. you're working together. Yes. You're not saying to the, the supplier, I'll tell you what, knock 10% off and you can keep the business yeah what what are you doing to that account manager to that business they would just go home completely deflated go they're not interested in us they're not interested yeah. in anything they just want cheap and you you kind of summed it up earlier when you said that you know any any buyer needs to um you know be able to then reinvest back in that relationship mm. you know and I, I think that was such a good point so if 
people want to work with you, what does it look like? Do you do a program? Is it one-off sessions? How does it how does it work for you? It's 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 very bespoke to each client. I can I can do a basic health check, as I call it. I come in and I go through the systems and ways of working and processes. I can do a full training program. I can do an end-to-end uh, implementation, if you like, of, of um, best practice procurement. And you know, a lot of people are interested in saying, well, if you're already here, can you talk to my sales team as well? Yeah. So, uh, and the mentoring and the training, the majority of which can be now done virtually because people are a lot more accepting that as well. That opens up the global market. I think, you know, I had five or six training sessions set up just for lockdowns, which I lost immediately because we couldn't travel in Singapore, Dubai, Oman, etc. Whereas now I, I can deliver virtually. Yeah. So it actually works out a lot cheaper for the client because they don't have to pay my expenses. I don't have to travel. And more importantly for them, they don't have to create issues in their own business by having their people travel to one location from all over where, wherever it may be. Hasn't it changed our world in that respect? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm excited about the way that we can, I mean, somebody was saying on an earlier podcast, I was a guest on a podcast before this, they were talking about this hybrid approach of us now being able to train, as you say, online, but equally mm-hmm. at some point be able to still do some face-to-face because there's definitely this... Mm-hmm benefit in that but it's not all pressured to do everything face to face yeah I, th- I think i think hybrids are a, a, a real good way of putting it i said as far as i'm concerned we we, we can offer a solution that suits the client yeah. and that includes louise so you know, we, you know we we can both come in and be that resource and also i've, I've got access to associates who, who can come in and support me as well if you know, if the project is big enough so if, if anybody just wants to chat you know, i use this this phrase again not all advice costs money. You know, the contact details on LinkedIn, obviously, websites, Twisted Orange. Just really happy to help and, and understand where mutually beneficial opportunities might lie. It's really super that what you've done in that using that kind of procurement skills and all that fabulous knowledge to work with salespeople. And I know you're also obviously working in that procurement space still. Mm. But to be able to then push it into that sales space, that's really fab. I love that. I love that a lot. That's, that's good. I, that's I hope really cool. people listening do as well because yeah. you know, I'd like, like to do a lot more of it. Yeah, um, it's gold, and, Andy. It's gold because yeah. any salespeople needs to speak to somebody like you. There's a whole wealth of knowledge right there, isn't there, you know? It, there's, there's a lot of years, yes. Yeah. Um, Oh, you um, have a UHP, that's for sure. I'm telling you now, that, that's brilliant. And we'll put all the links in so people can connect okay. with you. So don't worry about okay. that. They will be in this podcast for people to see. What, Thank you. Is there one place you hang out that you kind of think, that's the best place to find me? I'm kind of like, like for me, it's LinkedIn. I'm always on LinkedIn, you know, that's a good place. Yes, to yeah, I'm, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I love what you're doing. You know that. I've told you that a few times. And it's been so lovely to talk to you on my podcast because I knew this conversation would be interesting coming at it from, you know, a procurement man talking to a saleswoman. Um, That's got to be a great conversation, hasn't it? (laughs) Well, I think so, yeah. I mean, ultimately, a procurement man married a saleswoman because obviously my wife's in sales. Well, there um, you go then. Match made in heaven, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, and and she is very much boss, so I just want to make sure that that gets recorded as well. Yeah, you might need to just run this by her, this conversation. But the last thing I want to leave the listeners with is, is your final thoughts. So what advice would you give if you could give us one thing what would it be, do you think, that you'd like to leave the listeners with? I think it's be kind to yourself. Yeah. That's what I would say. And I think we're very good at being harsh about our actions, our thoughts, whatever it may be. Actually, just be kind to yourself and then the world's a lot better. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. That What an amazing way to finish that conversation. That's, that's wonderful. It really is. Thank you so much for joining yeah, me. I much appreciate it. Thank you. I, I really do appreciate the invite. It, it's, been, it's been fantastic to be able to talk. Yeah, it's, it's good to talk, isn't it? It's good to it talk. It is. It's very good to um, talk, yeah. And listeners, I really hope you've enjoyed that. Um, there's some really important 
things in that conversation for you to take on board, not just the whole business stuff, because that's gold dust, you know, that's wonderful. But the mental health stuff is also really important. And it's okay now to open up and it's okay to be kind to yourself, as Andy says. So I really hope that that's inspired you listening to our conversation. And of course, wherever you listen to, please just like and subscribe. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and of course on YouTube. So you can see Andy's fabulous face. So please do. Join us next time on The Human Conversation. Thanks for listening. Ta-ta for now. You've just been listening to The Human Conversation podcast with Jules White. To find out more about the other work that Jules does, please visit her website, www.liveitloveitsellit.co.uk. And if you enjoyed the podcast, then please do leave a rating and review on the platform you use to enjoy her show. Thanks for listening and see you next time.